starts right now. Tonight, a setback for a nonprofit dedicated to serving our community. Blessed Angels brings food to senior citizens and toys to kids in our area, but it's not going to be able to do that as much after a break in because now half of the nonprofit's vehicles don't work. And as the night team's John Paul Barajas explains, this is going to hurt the neediest people who depend on that group for the holidays. And this was like, oh my gosh, what are we dealing with? All four tires gone. This is how staff at Blessed Angels found one of their work vehicles Monday morning, just sitting on wooden stumps and planks. I've seen all of these items out randomly in the ditch areas with like the homeless. Operations manager Austin Verrett says whoever broke their fence took their time once they got inside, breaking the window of a second vehicle and then popping the hood. Everything was cut for the battery like they were trying to take it out. So they flipped all this over. Yeah, it was just a mess. With two out of four work vehicles out of commission, it's a struggle for staff to complete their day to day work. Today, nobody got food. And tomorrow, I don't know what we're going to do because we have to use the cars to go pick up the seniors to come to the senior center. So I don't have I don't have any transportation to deliver food this week at all. For CEO Marion Thomas, this couldn't have happened at a worse time. Blessed Angels is preparing for its second toy drive where staff hope to give out more than 750 toys. When something like this happens, it takes us a step back. Like right now, I'm trying to prepare for Friday to get enough toys and bicycles and things for kids. Now I've got to put a hold on it and save our money because now we've got the deductible and who knows what else. Now, San Antonio police are aware and are investigating this case. As for staff at Bless Angels, they say what they need most right now is donations and forms of transportation. If you're interested in helping out, we'll have a link on our website, ksat.com. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. In other news tonight, the Texas Supreme Court has ruled against a woman who is challenging our state's abortion laws. Just hours before that ruling, Kate Cox left Texas to receive an emergency abortion. Doctors say that her 20-week-old fetus has a rare, often fatal diagnosis, which puts her safety and fertility in jeopardy. There's no outcome here, you know, that um, results in us taking home a healthy baby girl. So let's go back. Last week, a lower court judge granted Cox's request for an emergency abortion. But here's the thing. Attorney General Ken Paxton appealed that, arguing that Cox's life was not at risk and did not meet the threshold for the exception. That's when Cox's lawyers say that she decided to seek an abortion in another state where the procedure's legal. I mean, think about how you would feel. You get this order saying, yes, my abortion can go forward. My doctor can give me the life-saving care, an abortion, which is what I need right now. And then all of a sudden, a court steps in and says on a Friday night, we need more time to think about it. It's simply outrageous, and people should be outraged by what is happening in Texas right now. So tonight, the Texas Supreme Court ruled in favor of the attorney general saying, quote, the exception requires a doctor to decide whether Mrs. Cox's difficulties pose such risks. But her doctor could not, or at least did not, attest to the court that Mrs. Cox's condition poses the risks the exception requires. So right now, we don't know where Cox is going to go to have that procedure. By the way, Texas is one of 21 states enforcing abortion restrictions ever since Roe v. Wade was overturned last year. Another arrest for that teen, that teen who was shot last year by a San Antonio police officer in the parking lot of McDonald's. For the second time in less than a month, Eric Cantu faces felony charges of evading arrest with the vehicle. This time, it was Universal City Police who took the 18-year-old into custody at gunpoint. Cantu also faces a misdemeanor charge of failure to provide information after his arrest, which was Saturday. Last month, San Antonio police booked him into jail in an unrelated evading arrest. If you remember, this was the teen who was hospitalized for almost two months after he was shot in October of last year by now fired officer James Brennan in a civil rights case that made national headlines. Now, Cantu has been arrested three times since being shot, twice for ev evading, once for theft. And on January 9th, he has a pre-hearing in his most recent evading case. Tomorrow, we're going to be closer to finding out how long a man is going to spend in jail for a drive-by shooting that claimed the life of that four-year-old boy to Earl Vion Whitley. That crime happened in 2017. Last week, a jury convicted Quentin Phillips. His sentencing starts at 10 a.m. tomorrow, and he faces five to 99 years or life in prison.
This is really a troubling trend. A 27 year old man killed yesterday during a confrontation with San Antonio Park Police. It marks the latest deadly encounter between local law enforcement officers and suspects who are wanted on warrants. According to SAPD Chief William McManus, police used a taser on the suspect but say that it, it didn't have an effect. It didn't slow him down. McManus says that as the struggle continued, the suspect then grabbed an officer's gun. That's what the chief is saying. Uh, that's also when the chief says that a second officer fired their weapon, then hitting and killing the suspect. And the details surrounding this is really worrisome to people in the community. It's getting closer and closer to, to home. home. Yeah. Now, according to SAPD figures, its officers have been involved in about two dozen shootings this year. Two weeks ago, officers killed a man that they say pulled a weapon on them. In other cases, including one on the northeast side in October, officers were wounded and hospitalized. Chief McManus says that in recent cases, the people clashing with officers have criminal records. Switching gears, I don't know if you're keeping track, but by the end of this week, a lot of kids are going to begin their winter breaks. However, as the 19's Patty Santos tells us, those who are fighting to keep schools safe never take a break. Safety continues to be at the forefront for all school districts in our area. Monday, several school boards discussed the findings of their random intruder detection audits in November. As a result of the Uvalde school shooting, all Texas public schools now get a surprise visit by state-trained inspectors. Those inspectors investigate whether school campuses are properly secured. Harlandale ISD said it was not audited last month. However, a district spokeswoman tells KSET that Harlandale's last eight state audits had zero findings. Northeast ISD reports eight out of its 10 audits were cleared of issues while staff addressed the problems in two of its other findings immediately. Please speak to your children about not opening doors to strangers. Even if they're school employees, school employees know the doors uh, or should know the doors that they have a card reader at and they need to use them. San Antonio ISD trustees also reviewed a district security audit in closed session. Details were not immediately available. For school safety, many districts won't release which campuses failed the inspections. To find out your district's results, contact that district directly. Over at South San ISD, the board voted on a resolution agreeing that one of their board members caused a disruption of their meeting last month. The vote is a formality. The trustee was arrested and charged with evading arrest. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Tomorrow, San Antonio ISD is going to talk about plans to relocate Steel Montessori Academy. Its community input meeting on that move is going to be held at Highlands High School at 6 p.m. If you remember last month, the board voted to close 15 campuses within the SAISD, but many other schools that aren't on that list, they're going to be affected too because some of them are going to be merged with other schools and others will have to welcome students that will have to be relocated. We had a light freeze this morning. We felt the chill in the air, not as cold tomorrow morning or really the rest of the week. No more freezes. We'll be in the upper 30s in some outlying areas tomorrow morning, including Canyon Lake 38, Del Rio about 38, 37 in Kerrville, 40 around San Antonio at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. So still a chill in the air, but we're not talking freezing. Then by tomorrow afternoon, we're well into the 60s, right near 70 degrees. We have a lot to talk about. First of all, no more freezes. Friendly reminder there, not for this week. Clouds will take over our sky. That will lead to some dampness and better rain chances. We'll talk about that system and how much rain we could get in just a bit. Adam, thank you. Now let's go to your night beat news flash. We're learning more tonight about the 16 year old high school student who was found dead in the bathtub of her East Texas home last week. A 23 year old man reportedly confessing to stabbing Lizbeth Medina. That's according to the Victoria Advocate newspaper, which spoke with the Edna police chief about the investigation. Now, Edna is just northeast of Victoria. Police arrested Rafael Romero on Saturday night. He does have a criminal history. And according to ABC affiliate KTRK in Houston, he has overstayed his visa in the U.S. Now, right now, we're still working to learn if or how Romero knew the victim. Israeli forces now battling Palestinian militants in Gaza's two largest cities. And droves of civilians there are trapped right there in the middle of it. The IDF is claiming that it's killed 7,000 Hamas fighters since the war began in October. And according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, about 18,000 Palestinians in Gaza have died since the fighting began. 
U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is going to provide unwavering support for Israel through this war and is also working with the country to lower civilian casualties. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Now, the San Antonio Food Bank is setting records when it comes to making sure that people in need have something to eat during the holiday season. The 13th annual Harvest from the Heart campaign is going to distribute more than 4 million pounds of food. You heard that right. But here's the thing. If you're struggling, it can also help you. If you're struggling as a family and the holidays are creating some extra burden, this is the time to reach out to the San Antonio Food Bank because we can help. Okay, so... The food bank is saying that HEB played a massive role in this year's record-breaking Harvest from the Heart campaign. Also, local farmers and produce vendors, they also had a big hand in this. We want you to stick around. Coming up, big things are in the works for downtown San Antonio. How the Alamo Plaza redesign project is going to bring money into the city and also new places for you to enjoy. Plus, we all know that it's kind to do things for others, but I have a question for you. Did you know that volunteering could also be good for your health? Yeah, we're going to talk after the break. The holiday season is a time when so many people are looking to do awesome things for other people. And as it turns out, volunteering later on in life could also do wonders for the helper. Listen to this. New studies presented at this year's Alzheimer's Association International Conference found that volunteering can boost memory and also postpone cognitive decline, even dementia. We spoke with a local health expert who says that it really comes down to social interaction. That's key because that's what protects your brain. Staying socially active is an important part of, of mental health, which obviously would impact folks' ability uh, to, to maintain cognitive function. Okay, makes sense. Dementia patients can also volunteer by sharing their story with others and joining a clinical trial to help other people. If you're looking for ways to volunteer, you can head to the Alzheimer's Association website or you could just look for this story on our website, ksat.com. Always a good idea to help. All right. $550 million, that's how much is going to go towards transforming the Alamo Historic District. At least that's the goal for the Alamo Trust, which believes that the investment is going to pump more than $11 billion into Bear County. That is the estimate within the first 10 years of the redesign debut. The plan here is to make the 12 acres around the Alamo easier to navigate with shade, seating, also new attractions like an education center and a visitor museum. If you think that you've seen the Alamo or you think you know the history of the Alamo, I challenge you to come back um, and I promise you will learn something you didn't know before and you will be wowed by the experience we have to offer now. So Dr. Kate Rogers also said that the current plan is the only one that's ever received broad support from city, county and state leaders. The final phase of the redesign should be done by 2027. All right, that's in the downtown area. I was down there just a few uh, just a few hours ago, and this is my favorite time of year to walk around downtown yes. because of all the lights. It's just so oh. pretty, and the weather not too bad. If you've just put on a jacket, yeah. it's you just you really can't complain. But it's just so pretty. But it's a good idea this week to keep that weather up handy. Oh, yeah, we're gonna have some fluctuations. Yes. It's, we're not the mornings will get warmer, but afternoons will actually get a little bit cooler, and we have some better rain chances on the way. Now I do want to talk a little bit about earlier this morning. Very quickly, we dropped down to 31 degrees. Degrees. That is the coldest reading we've had since February 1st here in San Antonio. We had a widespread light freeze early this morning. Now notice morning temperatures on the rise. 40 degrees tomorrow morning. Then we're in the 50s Wednesday, Thursday and Friday around sunrise when we typically hit our low temperature and then a cold front comes through and we'll see temperatures fall back down a little bit, but we're expecting them to be still above freezing in the 30s but above freezing mid to upper 30s by Sunday and even this time next week. Let's talk about our next big weather maker that's starting to come together in the northwestern U.S. here in the Pacific Northwest. This little curl, this little dip in the upper level flow, that's a weak disturbance right now that's going to be dropping southward toward us and actually strengthening. You can really see it better when you look at the water vapor imagery. This little swirl, that little comma-shaped, 
right there almost uh, that little bend that little swirl. That's the weak disturbance that's going to continue to push southward, amplify and strengthen, bringing some high elevation snow to the Rockies and parts of New Mexico and Colorado over the next couple of days and even maybe the panhandle of Florida. I mean, Florida. <laughs> Panhandle of Texas, a wintry mix. <laughs> I may in laws in town from Florida right now, right? It gets on my mind sometimes. Anyway, a little bit of a wintry mix up in the Panhandle, potentially Thursday around here. Just better chances of scattered rain as we get into Friday. And that would be most likely the middle part of the day as of right now. Then it moves out of here, it clears on out, and into the weekend we're dry. Now the best rain potential is off to the north of us where over two inches is possible, and even in East Texas where two inches of rain is possible. But it's within the realm of possibility that here in our neck of the woods we could get up to an inch of rain in some locations, not everybody, but in some spots. Now, if this trends a little farther to the north, then we'd be we'd be trimming back on that number. But the way it looks right now, there's at least that potential. That's nice to have between now and then, because that's Friday when we have our best rain chance at 60%. We're actually going to have some dampness, and that's mainly on Wednesday, waking up to the drizzle, mist, sprinkles, very light little showers possible. It's just overall dampness, but real rain is only at about 40%, so not much to show for it. Thursday, a 20% chance. That's, I think most of the rain on Thursday would be closer to the Rio Grande. And then Friday, we all have that shot with better coverage likely at 60%. Tomorrow, just increasing clouds, 40 in the morning, 68 in the afternoon. Clouds becoming thicker gradually throughout the day, and then clouds will be the dominant feature in the sky for the remainder of the work week. Near 70 tomorrow, south side near Stinson, 71, 68 elsewhere around town, Nixon, Smiley, 71, and Sabadol at 68 for the high temperature. Notice those afternoon highs, they fall off a little bit. Low 60s Wednesday, Thursday. Then we're talking upper 50s, 57 for the high by Friday and even Saturday. Actually, Friday, a cold front's going to move through, and that's going to drop those temperatures a little bit for the weekend. But afternoons dropping below average soon. Okay, thank you, Adam. You know, I noticed a moment ago, Larry, when you walked into the studio, you were kind of dragging your feet a little bit. I get it. 17 is a hard number. That is a very hard number. 17 straight losses, a franchise record for the San Antonio Spurs, but Wimby once again was the bright spot. 15 points, 18 rebounds, and this vicious slam dunk. And as far as the Texans are concerned, C.J. Stroud's game status is very much up in the air. Coming up. What an amazing feeling for the Smithson Valley football team. They're going to state in big board sports. Wimby and the Spurs played in Houston tonight, looking to snap their 16 game slide. First quarter, Wimby takes the inbounds pass and then he knocks down a three for the lead. And then not long after that, he twists his right ankle while going for the ball. I mean, it looks nasty, but he hopped right back up and he kept on playing. Spurs led 21-19 after one. Second quarter, the Rockets will lead by as many as 10. Jeff Green over Wimby, three pointer, and it's 35-25 Houston. Spurs fight back though. Malachi Branham crossover over to the rim. He goes in for two of his 11 first half points to lead all scorers. Spurs trail 51-47 in halftime. Third quarter, San Antonio still playing from behind when we get the dunk of the game. Branham to Wimbanyama for an instant poster shot right over Sengun. Let's look at it in slow motion. The jam and the foul just too easy for the 7'4", 19-year-old rookie, but the Rockets still led 69-62 after three. My goodness. Fourth quarter, San Antonio cannot take the lead in part because they made five of 41 three-point attempts for the game. The Spurs hold the first opponent this season to less than 100, but they still lose 93-82 for their 17th straight loss, a franchise record. They were great. Uh, just, you know, you got to make a shot in the NBA. You, you can't shoot five for 41 from three. That's not going to happen. It's hard to uh, know what to do when you're missing that many shots. It just makes it very, very difficult. 
but they're growing in all kinds of ways. Uh, and I just wish they could catch a break that way as far as making some shots. Spurs will come back to town to host the Lakers for two straight games. First up Wednesday night at 7 at the Frost Bank Center. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans head coach D'Amico Ryans confirmed today that starting quarterback C.J. Stroud is in concussion protocol after hitting his head hard on the turf in their loss at the Jets yesterday. The 7-6 Texans will next play at the 4-8 Titans Sunday at noon with Stroud's status up in the air. I don't think uh, many guys haven't came back the following week after after a concussion just is you have to make sure at the end of the day no matter the position no matter who the guy is you have to make sure your guys are healthy and we're protecting guys and that right when it comes to the concussion all right or the head injuries we have to make sure we're protecting all of our guys because it's more about their long-term health as opposed to just everybody gets excited about the next game and the next opportunity but we care about these guys as men off the field and making sure their health is the the at utmost importance to us. And the Dallas Cowboys beat the Philadelphia Eagles 33-13 last night, picking up a key NFC East win. Both teams are now 10-3 and, and tied for first place, but the Cowboys hold the tiebreaker on the Eagles based on a better winning percentage in division games. And Dak said the boys really needed this one. It was big. We needed it. Uh, yeah, let's not sugarcoat that. We needed that. Uh, obviously, I've talked about it before. Mike talks about it, about grabbing a huge chunk of confidence and moving forward. And um, being able to do that against a team like that here at home, a um, place that we've had a lot of success at over the last two years. Uh, it was a great team win, much needed win. Um, but we got to turn the page quick, especially in this league, especially with where we've placed ourselves. Uh, I can't sit here and celebrate on this. This was our expectation of tonight, and um, we played to our standards. So now it's about doing that again next week. Swiss and Valley football is still going after the break. It was a cold morning in Spring Branch where the Smithson Valley Rangers are holding their last week of practice this football season. The guys are hoping to add 23 under state champs to the Ranger football history sign located next to their field house. The Rangers are getting ready to face undefeated Alito for the UIL Class 5A D1 state championship. It's the first ever meeting between the two schools and winner takes all. I'm really excited, you know, only two teams get to go and just it's an opportunity and we're ready to just go out there and take it and go out there and play. I mean, it, it's really special. I mean, we're obviously making history out here, but we're just going to once again treat it like normal. I mean, it's it's another game. We're going to treat it how we always treat every game. There's going to the state championship game and then there's winning the state championship. And, uh, you know, we've we've accomplished the first, but we're after the second, you know. So we try to, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time congratulating ourselves or patting on the, ourselves on the back or celebrating our success. That's all well and good, but we're focused on winning the game. Smithson Valley will face Alito Friday night at 7 at AT&T Stadium for the Class 5A D1 State Championship. I love the focus that you right? see from the teams and the coaches this time of year. I mean, they're just, they're not even kidding around. It's got to be laser focus. I get it. Right. All right. Thank you. We'll be right back.